morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome to the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series. And for those who have attended our series before, welcome back, always a pleasure. My name is Dr. Megan Wong, and I am a lecturer at the School of Law, University of Essex, and the founding director of the LLM in International Law Degree. Together with Dr. Emily Jones, we are the co-founders and co-conveners of the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series. I am delighted to be your host for today's event with our speaker, Dr. Kate Storr, which will be chaired by Dr. Emily Jones. And I will defer to Dr. Jones, our excellent chair for today, to introduce our wonderful speaker. Um, but a little bit as my role as host, I wanted to tell you a bit more about our series. Uh, our lecture series was opened this spring term by Professor Sean Murphy, who spoke on the conundrum of rising sea levels in international law. And today we're very pleased to have Dr. Kate Storr's lecture entitled, From Sacred Trust to Common Heritage, the Uncommons History of the Common Heritage of Mankind. The Essex Public International Law Lecture Series is built upon two important intellectual traditions of public international law, formalism and international legal practice, international legal theory, including post-colonial and feminist perspectives. The idea for a series stems very much first and foremost from our friendship and is inspired from our respect for each other's scholarship and research. We are both generalist public international lawyers with several specialist interests, including our mutual interest in international law of the sea, international environmental law, and the law and the use of force, but we write from very different approaches. I'm a formalist and Dr. Jones is a critical legal scholar, and we hope that this series brings together something for everyone. Now, let me introduce our excellent chair for today's event. Dr. Emily Jones is a senior lecturer in law at the University of Essex at the School of Law. She's a generalist public international lawyer specializing in gender and international law, science and technology and international law and international environmental law. She recently published a co-authored book with Bloomsbury entitled The Law of War and Peace, a Gender Analysis, um, the first volume. And her monograph, Feminist Theory and International Law Posthuman Perspectives, is forthcoming with Routledge's Glass House series, so something we can all look forward to. Um, and now let me hand over the event, so to speak, to my very formidable friend and colleague, um, co-founder, co-convener, Dr. Lee, uh, Dr. Emily Jones, to start today's event. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong. Um, it's a pleasure, as always, to be here with you today. And I'm, of course, very proud to be your chair today for Dr. Kate Storr's lecture. Um, I think Dr. Storr is really a perfect fit for this series in many ways, and as Dr. Wong outlined, that brings this kind of formalist and more critical perspectives together. And I think today's paper will really kind of exemplify that, drawing on doctrinal work, the kind of historical analysis and, and critical perspectives as well. So um, a wonderful speaker for the series. But to introduce our speaker properly, um, Dr. Kate Storr is Chancellor, Chancellor's Postdoctoral Research Fellow in the Faculty of Law at University of Technology, Sydney. Her research addresses the relationship between property, territory and jurisdiction in international law, with a particular focus on decolonial struggles for legal control over natural resources. She's published on the history of international administration, the concept of territory in international law, Australian imperialism in the Pacific, decolonization, and international environmental law. And her current project, which is entitled Regulating New Mining in the International Seabed and Space, examines the history and politics of the law governing resource extraction in domains beyond national jurisdiction. Dr. Storr has held positions as a lecturer at the University of Melbourne at, and at the University of Glasgow, and her monograph, which um, I would recommend you check out, um, International Status in the Shadow of Empire, Naru and the Histories of International Law, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2020. So as Dr. Wong mentioned, Dr. Storr is going to be speaking to, today to the title of From Sacred Trust to Common Heritage, The Uncommon's History of the Common Heritage of Mankind. So a very quick housekeeping rule, if you wanna ask a question, there's a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. It's like two little speech bubbles and it says Q&A. Um, so please use that to ask questions. You can ask questions at any point, but I'll be asking them of Dr. Storr at the end of the lecture. 
Um, if you want to remain anonymous, i.e. you don't want me to read out your name, then please click the little tab that says ask a question anonymously. And otherwise, um, I will probably read out your name. So just be aware of that, please. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Storr, over to you. Really looking forward to hearing your contribution. And thank you for being here with us today. Thank you both Megan and Emily. I'm really thrilled to join you in this series. The series so far has been absolutely fabulous. So I'm really honored to speak to you today. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am on indigenous land. I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora nation and I pay my respect to elders past and present and to any indigenous people who may be with us today. So, Domains beyond national jurisdiction are often described as global commons. The phrase is used to describe the status of the Antarctic, outer space and oceans beyond national jurisdiction, including the seabed. In international law, however, the term global commons has no formal meaning. It is not used in any of the three treaty frameworks settled between the late 1950s and the early 1980s to apply to these domains. The rise in popular usage of the phrase global commons followed the inclusion in the 1979 Moon Agreement and the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention of the principle of the common heritage of mankind. As geopolitical tensions ramp up over what seems to be imminent resource extraction in space, the international seabed and potentially the Antarctic, this paper revisits the historical origins of the common heritage principle. In doing so, I'll make two arguments in two parts. The first part is largely doctrinal. It argues that despite their the conflation in contemporary diplomatic and popular discourse, the concept of the commons, the principle of common heritage, and the Grotian concept of res communis omnium are, or at least have been up until this point, historically, legally, and functionally distinct. To sketch these distinctions quickly at their most crude, the commons is a class of collective property holding originating in European feudal land law. Common heritage is a principle of public international law that coalesced in the mid 20th century to prohibit sovereign appropriation of specific geophysical domains and assert international jurisdiction over them. And res communis omnium is a Roman law concept most famously reconstructed by Grotius to describe all things beyond sovereign jurisdiction that either physically cannot be occupied or are so plentiful as to render private appropriation senseless. The contemporary conflation of these three concepts arises not simply from their superficially shared terminology, but from two misleading presumptions that are now rife in debates over the regulation of natural resources beyond national jurisdiction and particularly in space law. The first misleading presumption is that the common heritage principle as it emerged in the late 1960s institutionalized the Grotian concept of res communis omnium. The second misleading presumption is that res communis omnium is tantamount to the domestic commons ramped up to global scale. These presumptions, which are now chronic and I argue misleading, if not openly wrong, erase the historically significant legal distinctions between these three concepts, combining them into one legally and functionally ambiguous notion of global commons. The second part of this paper is largely historical. It argues that the common heritage principle emerged not from an attempt to globalize the domestic commons or from an attempt to institutionalize res communis omnium. Rather, it emerged as a direct evolution of the principle of international trusteeship. This is not the story that is commonly told about the origins of common heritage, which are usually located in Maltese diplomat Arvid Pardo's 1967 speech to the UN General Assembly calling for international jurisdiction over the exploitation of mineral resources in the international seabed. But Pardo's proposal did not, of course, emerge in a vacuum. Pardo drew on numerous contemporary discourses of international politics and of natural law and translated them into a new principle for international law that would extend the existing principle of trusteeship to demand domains beyond national jurisdiction. <clears throat> 
I'll trace some of those strands as they moved from debates over Antarctica to outer space before coalescing as the common heritage of mankind principle in the late 1960s. I'll then conclude with some comments on why I think the conflation of commons, common heritage and res communis in the term global commons is obstructing progress in current debates over the status of resourcing domains beyond national jurisdiction and why recovering the origins of common heritage in trusteeship is particularly important for progressive attempts to promote stronger environmental and equitable principles within these debates. So to part one, the aim of this part is to sketch the doctrinal distinctions between commons, common heritage of mankind and res communis omnium. In the interest of time, these will be reductive sketches but will hopefully serve to establish the relevant distinctions between them. I'll start with commons. Commons talk is popular, but the term is used in multiple and conflicting senses. For example, it is used to refer to a legal, economic or political ideal of common property, to an actually existing institution of common property, past or present, or to a given domain, physical or otherwise, or even to specific resources within such a domain. It is also frequently used misleadingly to refer to non-proprietary conventions of collective resource use. The purpose of this subsection is to reprise the elements of commons as an institution of European property law. This is important to emphasize given commons is so often misunderstood as antithetical to the proprietary logic of European law, rather than as a long recognized class of property. So first, bear with me, I'll briefly re reprise the basic nature of a property right for those non-lawyers who are with us today. A property right is a right enforceable against the world at large. The relativity of property in common law systems adds, except a person with a better right. It is the enforceability of a right against the world at large that determines whether a right is proprietary or not, and not the nature of the rights holding subject or the object in which the right is held. This basic structure of a property right applies also to commons, understood as a species of property. A right or bundle of rights is held in a definable object by a definable class of subjects, as opposed to an individual subject exclusively, and that right is enforceable against the world at large, meaning legal persons not members of the rights holding class. Individual members of the rights holding class customarily have obligations to exercise their rights in common property with respect to the equal rights of other members, which may include limits, for example, on the quantum frequency or technique of use. Of course, this is an abstraction of the doctrine doctrinal structure of commons and it misses the cultural texture of the term. As an institution of Western European land law and specifically English land law, the commons is associated with communally held rights in natural resources, whether that resource is an area of land itself or the produce of land communally or otherwise held. Commons are most readily associated in the popular imagination with pre-industrial communities at a scale comparable to a village or town. Treatments of commons still tend to conjure up this pre-capitalist social imaginary, whether invoked as critique or defense of individual property rights. To make a final observation important for this paper, commons, both as doctrinal abstraction of property law and as an historical institution of European land holding exist within a recognized territorial jurisdictional order. To common heritage. The common heritage principle is a far more recent phenomenon which coalesced within international organizations over the 1960s. The first use of the phrase is attributed, as mentioned earlier, to Pardo's speech to the UNGA First Committee in November 1967. Surabhi Ranganathan has given the most incisive analysis of Pardo's speech, his reference materials and his motivations. Pardo called for the seabed and its resources to be declared the common heritage of mankind, a proposal subsequently adopted in the 1970 Declaration of Principles governing the seabed and ocean floor. 
But Pardo's formulation of common heritage went further than a mere declaration of status. As a new status, common heritage required that developing countries unable to participate directly in seabed resource exploitation be distributed some of any benefit thereby arising. And this principle of distribution of benefit would necessarily require the establishment of a new international regime with functional jurisdiction to affect that distribution. Whilst the scope of common heritage as a principle of international law was and remains contested, these are at least three settled elements of the concept. First, declaration of a given domain as common heritage. Second, equitable distribution, however interpreted, of the profits of resource exploitation within that domain to developing countries. And third, the existence of an international regime to enforce these norms. Rüdiger Wolfram later identified these three elements as essential to the principle of common heritage as institutionalized in part 11 of the Law of the Sea Convention in 1983. Wolfram also identified a fourth element as necessary to the logic of common heritage, the inauguration of mankind, which he termed the world community as a new unitary and indivisible subject of rights in the area. The international regime created to oversee resource exploitation in the area and distribution of benefit would do so on behalf of this new unitary and indivisible rights bearing subject. As both Maria Gavinelli and Isabel Feichtner have more recently argued, the common heritage principle, at least as juridified in the Law of the Sea Convention, is fundamentally a jurisdictional one. Common heritage amounts to the assertion over specific domains of a specific form of international jurisdiction with both territorial and functional dimensions. I'll say something quickly here about common heritage as it applies to space. Whilst the common heritage principle is most comprehensively articulated in, part, in the Part 11 seabed regime, it was first codified in the 1979 Moon Agreement. One of the least subscribed treaties negotiated within the UN framework, the Moon Agreement has returned to centre stage of space law in recent years. Whilst the agreement declares the Moon and its resources to be the common heritage of mankind, its construction of common heritage is explicitly severed from the version institutionalised in the Law of the Sea Convention. Article 11, subsection 1, declares that the moon and its natural resources are the common heritage of mankind, which finds its expression in the provisions of this agreement. This formulation was, pivotable, was pivotal to the agreement being accepted within the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. It was intended to sever common heritage in space law from parallel unclos negotiations and to curtail the possibility of common heritage being declared a US cogent's norm with respect to all domains beyond national jurisdiction. Bearing this severance of common heritage as it applies to space in mind, the Moon Agreement's articulation of the principle nevertheless also demonstrates the four elements identified as central to the seabed version. It asserts the status of common heritage over the Moon and its resources. It identifies mankind as a unitary and indivisible subject. It commits states parties to establishing an international regime to govern the exploitation of the resources of the moon and at least the purposes of that regime as including an equitable sharing by all states parties in the benefits derived with special consideration for the needs of developing countries. These sketches of commons and common heritage are crude, but hopefully they serve to illustrate the point as both legal and historical institutions, the two have remarkably little to do with each other. Despite this, the popularity of the phrase global commons has perpetuated an unhelpful degree of conflation in contemporary debates about space resource governance. The conflation of commons and common heritage arises, I'm going to argue, from two misleading presumptions. The first is that the common heritage principle juridified the Groschen concept of res communis omnium, I'll argue it did not. And secondly, that res communis omnium is a globalized version of the domestic commons, I'll argue it is not. 
So this requires us to consider where the concept of res communis omnium fits into this picture. The following account of res communis is again necessarily reductive. It's offered only to sketch at a high level its distinction from both commons and common heritage. Accounts of common heritage often begin with reference to Grotius's Mare Liberum, extracted in 1609 by the Dutch East India Company, the VOC, from his longer opus, De Jure Prede. As now comprehensively documented in the history of international law, Mare Liberum was constructed first as a legal defense of the VOC's actions in seizing a Portuguese ship in direct challenge of the Portuguese Spanish claim on the basis of the doctrine of discovery to exclusive possession of the high seas and monopoly over East Indian trade. Grotius's formulation of res communis drew on natural law debates to argue for a general freedom of navigation on the high seas and also to provide a justification for rights of private property in goods extracted therefrom. As Shriver and Prislan have noted, Grotius's account of res communis omnium was resolutely grounded in the logic of property. Grotius famously distinguished between res nullius, property of no one and susceptible to occupation by anyone, and res communis omnium, property of all and not susceptible to occupation by anyone. Grotius argued that only two categories of good fell within the scope of res communis omnium, First, things which were in infinite supply and thus sufficed for the use of all persons. And second, things which could not be subject to exclusive possession because they could not be occupied, but could nevertheless be used. His conclusion was that the high seas and natural goods within it fell into both categories of res communis, a conclusion that served the immediate purposes of the VOC. But as Shermeyer has explained, the real innovation of Mare Liberum was Grotius's justification of private property. His account of res communis omnium was constructed to serve that justification. Grotius drew on late scholastic defences of private ownership to justify property as grounded in the exercise of man's God-given free will. Setting to one side, Grotius's foreshadowing of modern labour-based theories of property for present purposes, it is enough to note that his restatement of res communis coalesced a proprietary logic in which all persons, natural and legal, were recognised as individual rights-bearing subjects, self-realising through ownership in accordance with God's will. And the object of property was limited to natural goods in those domains beyond recognised jurisdiction, not susceptible to occupation the use of which would not exhaust or diminish them. The question of enforcement of these norms in Grotius's formulation rested with God. This sketch of res communis omnium is offered to dispel or at least to trouble the two presumptions I identified earlier. First, that res communis is a globalized version of domestic commons. And second, that common heritage is the juridified version of res communis. The first presumption that res communis omnium is a globalized version of, of commons erases the problem of jurisdiction. Commons, at least as institutions of European property law, exist within recognized jurisdictional orders of territorial sovereignty. Res communis omnium by definition falls outside rec recognized jurisdiction relying solely on the recognition of Christian natural law doctrine to ground legal rights therein. The second presumption that common heritage is a juridified version of res communis is misleading in that the concept of res communis without more does nothing to explain or even require three of the central elements of common heritage, equitable distribution of benefit, the creation of an international regime with territorial and functional jurisdiction and the recognition of a universal, indivisible, rights-bearing subject. The phrase global commons, whatever its rhetorical power, therefore erases or at least obscures the significant distinctions in the jurisdictional presumptions on which these three concepts rest. I'll make two further observations now before moving on 
First, whatever the differences between them, all three concepts presume the Christian metaphysics of European law. And second, all three are grounded in the logic of property. So to move on to part two. From where then did the common heritage principle derive its logic, if not from commons or res communis? This part argues that common heritage evolved from the existing principle of international trusteeship. As a wave of critical scholarship over the last 20 years has explored, the UN trusteeship system was itself a renovation of the League of Nations mandate system and attempted to juridify and modernize the concept of the sacred trust of civilization used to justify European colonial and imperial domination over non-European peoples. The advent of the common heritage principle in the 1960s can be understood as an attempt to apply the existing trusteeship infrastructure to domains beyond sovereign jurisdiction. To make this argument, this part contextualizes Pardo's common heritage initiative within earlier diplomatic debates over the legal status of Antarctica and outer space. Both Antarctic and outer space governance emerged as fields of geopolitical struggle in the early decades of the Cold War. Notions of the province of all mankind and the common interest of mankind had appeared in scholarly literature from the early 20th century in respect of Antarctica and from the mid 1950s with respect to space. In the decades after the Second World War, the problem of how to regulate military and extractive activity in domains beyond national jurisdiction was at the avant-garde of international legal scholarship. Prominent mainstream jurists, including Robert Jennings, Philip Jessup, Wilfred Jenks and Oscar Schachter, all turned their minds, often for sustained periods, to the jurisdictional dilemmas raised by increasing activity in airspace and the Antarctic. At the same time, as membership of international organizations swelled, decolonizing states increasingly regarded international administration as a mode of participation in, rather than subjugation to, international law. Over the 1950s and 1960s, there were calls for UN trusteeship council jurisdiction to be applied to the Antarctic and outer space. Trusteeship in both its conceptual and institutional dimensions was reworked and adapted in prototypical guises by international scholars and diplomats, including Krishna Menon, Philip Jessup, and Aldo Coxa, before it was picked up by Arvid Pardo in his 1967 speech. So I'll start with Antarctica. The 1959 Antarctic settlement was a pivotal moment in post-war debates over domains beyond national jurisdiction. Conflicting claims to Antarctica had been made over the 19th and early 20th centuries by France, Norway, Britain, which delegated parts of its claims to Australia and New Zealand in the 1930s, and then Chile and Argentina, both of which claim title derived by succession of prior Spanish claim. The Antarctic dispute was out of step with the new UN system in the post-war years and was criticised by non-claimants as a hangover of 19th century imperial aggrandisement. As the new UN system took shape, Antarctic claimants were concerned to prevent the UN from intervening in their escalating dispute. The United States too wanted to avoid formal international debate over the status of Antarctica which would have offered the Soviet Union a platform for challenging US military activity on the continent. From the early 1950s then, the question of Antarctica became a minor arena of Cold War politics and the Antarctic claimants could establish little common ground. That changed in 1956, when India made an unexpected move to promote the UN as the appropriate forum for Antarctic governance. India's initiative was spearheaded by Krishna Menon, the first High Commissioner of India to Britain and close associate of Prime Minister Nehru. Nehru and Menon were figureheads of developing third world solidarity and leaders in the new non-aligned movement and saw an opportunity to exercise that leadership via direct challenge to Antarctic claimants. At Menon's instigation, India made preliminary moves towards listing the question of Antarctica for debate in the General Assembly in 1956, 
India's original case was that Antarctica should be brought within the existing trusteeship system to avert the assumption of control by a closed club of imperial claimants. India's campaign for Antarctic trusteeship was taken as a serious challenge by all claimants and above all by its Commonwealth partners, the UK, Antarctica, Australia and New Zealand. Wary of the shifting balance of power within the UN system, Antarctic claimants rallied together to work against the prospect of UN intervention. Claimants argued that trusteeship was relevant only to the governance of subject populations and therefore unsuitable for Antarctica. India ultimately amended its UN submission in October 1956, capitulating to pressure from within the Commonwealth to remove trusteeship language. It did so and instead advocated for peaceful utilisation of Antarctica. Although the Indian trusteeship initiative was short lived on its own terms, it had the ironic effect of catalyzing the Antarctic settlement, as Chaturvedi and Haukins have documented. Antarctic treaty negotiations gathered momentum, eventually becoming intertwined with the International Geophysical Year in 1957 to 1958. Claimants shared objectives in maintaining their sovereign claims and avoiding UN oversight were eventually reflected in the Antarctic Treaty concluded in 1959. That treaty famously froze the status quo, neither prohibiting nor recognising ex existing claims, but prohibiting new or expanded claims. In late 1959, in reaction to the conclusion of the Antarctic Treaty, the UN General Assembly resolved to establish the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, the COPWAS, and defensively declared the common interest of mankind in outer space. The new COPWAS was charged in the wake of the Antarctic Treaty with reporting on the prospect of the incorporation of space within the remit of the existing UN framework in language that bore implicit reference to the Antarctic settlement. The establishment of the COP was prompted a wave of new scholarship on space law. In 1959, US international law professors Philip Jessup and Controls for Outer Space and the Antarctic Analogy a widely influential text that traced the evolution of forms of international administration from the 19th century condominium through the mandate and trusteeship regimes and into the Antarctic Treaty. Jessup and Taubenfeld concluded that to avert an Antarctic-like settlement in space, direct international administration of spatial activity was the appropriate and probably the only viable arrangement to keep outer space from becoming an arena of national conflict. Their book was widely and favorably reviewed, including by Bin Cheng, former PCI judge, who famously went on to propose the concept of instant custom, by Oscar Schachter, UN aide of the, of the US, and by Wilfred Jenks, later president of the ILO, who cited the work as inspiring his 1965 treatise on space law. The terms of what was to become the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, the OST, were negotiated within the COPWAS over the mid-1960s. The OST ultimately prohibited prohibited militarization and national appropriation and permitted exploration and use of space. Use was understood to include resource exploitation, but the COPWAS failed to reach agreement on what remained two central dilemmas in space resources law. The legal status of space resources in the absence of territorial jurisdiction and how space resource utilization can in practice be regulated. Both questions were admitted, omitted from the OST altogether and left to the COPWAS legal subcommittee to negotiate in a separate agreement. It was in the COPWAS legal subcommittee that Argentinian international lawyer Aldo Coxer first proposed the recognition of a universal and indivisible rights bearing subject with rights in space. Coxer distinguished his proposal from the Groschen concept of res communis omnium by figuring outer space as res communis humanitatis. Coxer had been working on this proposal from the late 1950s in natural law treatises on space. It's a subject for a different paper, 
but it's hard to dismiss as coincidence that both Coxa and Pardo were not only Catholic, but members of the order of the Knights of Malta, and that Coxa's humanitatis proposal was formulated during the Second Vatican Council that ran between 1962 and 1965. For now, it's enough to note that Coxa's speech to the legal subcommittee was made in June 1967, predating Pardo's seabed speech by three months. Pardo's new common heritage vocabulary was therefore closer both in time and ideology to Cox's Vatican II era res communis humanitatis than to Grotius's Dutch Protestant res communis omnium. Diplomatic debates over Antarctica and outer space over the 1950s and 1960s therefore provide vital con context for Pardo's formulation of common heritage. Pardo's overriding concern in his 1967 speech was less with the adoption of the language of common heritage per se, the phrase appears once, than with the establishment of international jurisdiction and control over the seabed and ocean floor. Pardo's formulation of common heritage thereby sought to appropriate to the UN what Grotius had left to God. According to Pardo, an effective international regime could best be developed under the auspices of the UN. He went on to address directly the problem evaded by the COPWAS of the jurisdiction that would be needed to ground proprietary rights in common heritage domains. To quote, the UN authority must acquire jurisdiction of the resources on and under the sea floor. This jurisdiction must permit it to part and protect exclusive rights of entrepreneurs and must also have the ability to take or extract rent or royalty payments for the use of the resources and distribute those revenues in an acceptable manner. Pardo's ambit for UN control over the seabed was grounded in his own professional experience. An original member of the UN Secretariat, Pardo had worked for the trusteeship department from 1945 to 1961. In 1964, when Malta joined the UN, Pardo became its first permanent representative. Keen for Malta to make a mark on the UN structure, Pardo drew on his trusteeship experience and on Cox's res communis humanitatis proposal to propose a dedicated seabed regime. As Ranganathan has noted, Pardo was motivated by more than Catholic virtue. His prosaic goal in proposing common heritage as a new jurisdictional principle of international law was for the new UN seabed regime to be headquartered in Malta. After Pardo's speech, the General Assembly established the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of the Seabed, Kopuos's seabed twin. In its 1969 report, the committee documented a predictably stark divergence of views. The Seabed Committee went on to become the first committee of UNCLOS III, which went on to debate the question for nine years before settling on the Part 11 regime in the Law of the Sea Convention in 1983. Now, this, can, this history has been comprehensively covered by Twail and Marxist scholars in the context of the NIEO of analysis of the NIEO movement. So I'm not going to go into depth here. To summarize the argument made in this part, explaining common heritage by reference to commons or res communis omnium obscures far more direct connections with preceding decades of legal, political and institutional development. Earlier debates over the legal status of Antarctica and space provided the immediate context for Pardo's 1967 speech which borrowed from India's earlier call for trusteeship to be asserted over Antarctica and Aldo Cox's call for res communis humanitatis to be asserted in respect of space. The vocabulary of trust and trusteeship was explicit in the early work of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of the Seabed, but it largely dropped from view after 1970 as the trusteeship system itself waned in relevance to be replaced by the new vocabulary of common heritage. That vocabulary obscured the functional origins of common heritage in the earlier principle of international trusteeship. And it also fed into heated debates over the concept of commons that were to take place in development discourse over the 1970s and 1980s. So 
I'll wrap up by concluding with some comments on why I think all of this matters. This paper has argued for greater attention to the historical origins of the common heritage principle as distinct from both commons and res communis omnium. By recontextualizing the principle as emerging from mid 20th century debates over the legal status of the Antarctic in space, a major aim of the paper is to resituate the common heritage of mankind within a much longer history of experimentation in international administration rather than reading it backwards through ideological debates over commons that were subsequently to branch in multiple directions over the 1970s and 1980s, sparked by Garrett Hardin's notorious tragedy of the commons fable and Eleanor Ostrom's liberal developmentalist account of the commons. This familial relationship between trusteeship and common heritage repeatedly reveals itself still in debate over the institutional design of regimes to govern activity in domains beyond national jurisdiction. To give one important example, Elizabeth Manbull Gazy, renowned advocate of international ocean governance, proposed in her 1995 book, Ocean Governance and the United Nations, that the Trusteeship Council hold in sacred trust the principle of the common heritage of mankind. Borgesis is not the only renewed call for trusteeship. Trusteeship is increasingly being proposed as a solution to the question of space re resource utilization in contemporary debates, as though it is novel, without reference or understanding of the paternalist history of trusteeship and the colonial origins of the concept of sacred trust. Regaining purchase on the origins of common heritage in trusteeship on the one hand, and of the distinctions between commons, common heritage and res communis omnium on the other is not, or at least I hope not, an empty exercise in legal historical pedantry. The principles that should govern resource use in space have once again become a volatile geopolitical fault line. But contemporary debates over the norms and institutions that do and the norms that should govern space resource utilisation are rife with false equivalences between these three concepts. The use of the container concept of global commons tends to divide debate into pro-commons and anti-commons blocks, but neither have a clear answer to the crucial questions underlying the space resource debate. First, which authority in the absence of sovereign jurisdiction can exercise the territorial jurisdiction over space activity that will ultimately be necessary to enforce resource rights granted in space, remembering that enforceability is necessary to the existence of property, and secondly, which authority should exercise that jurisdiction. After a decades long gridlock in negotiations over the legal status of space resources, Clarifying the internal logic of commons, common heritage and res communis omnium is therefore useful first and foremost as a ground clearing exercise for lawyers and diplomats working on the question of space resource utilisation. Clarifying the distinctions between these three concepts is important, not to argue that they are necessarily fixed objects of law in the present, but as a means of better understanding the ideological and legal battles that have been waged over these dom domains in the past, to observe how these battles are shifting and to consider how to best intervene in that shift. The use of the notion of global commons is, I would argue, not a helpful avenue forward and arguably actively obstructs progress towards political agreement in these debates. So understanding the distinctions matters. But my second and perhaps most personal aim in clarifying the historical distinctions between commons, common heritage and res communis omnium is to identify what is in fact common if counterintuitively to all three. And that is the presumption of the propertization of nature as a self-evident good or at least as an inevitability that cannot be averted, only moderated through international regulation. As global markets reorient towards a post-fossil fuel energy economy and demand for rare earth metals and minerals skyrockets, the need to challenge these presumptions before they are incorporated into the foundation of legal agreements currently being debated is urgent. 
And I would particularly encourage those now seeking to deploy commons language progressively against conservative attacks on the ideal, ideals of environmental protection and global and intergenerational equity to consider the implications of the grounding of all three concepts in the logic of property. My hope is that clarifying the history of common heritage and distinguishing the, uh, between these concepts and identifying the proprietary logic of all three might help to create room for normative approaches to domains beyond national jurisdiction that do not presume the virtue or inevitability of commercial exploitation of natural resources in domains beyond national jurisdiction, that do not adopt the Christian natural law presumption to human dominion over the earth and the heavens, and ultimately that do not presume the virtue or the inevitability of proprietary relationships to nature. If ever there was a time to challenge these presumptions, it is now. <laughs>